Welcome once again to Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship Sunday morning service. We're glad to have you here with us, and we just thank you and appreciate you for all of your kind words and support. And so uh, today, before we begin, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your great plan for our lives. Thank you for your provision, for your salvation, for your protection, for all that you have done for us and all that you are doing. And now, Lord, we want to open up our hearts and our minds to your word, that we might receive the word of God, that it might be engrafted upon our hearts, that we can walk in such a way, Lord, as to completely glorify you with every aspect of our lives. Thank you, Father, for this day. I pray for those uh, that are listening right now, Lord Jesus, that are going through trials and struggles. This is a time where many people are going through trials. I pray, Lord, that you would be their Jehovah Jireh, that you would you would be there and provide for them during this time of struggle. I pray that you would be their Jehovah Rapha. You would be their healing right now in this time of struggle, that you would protect them, you would provide for them. I just speak healing to all those who right now have been afflicted by sickness. And I just say in the name of Jesus, be made whole right now. And Lord, we thank you for your word because your word gives life. So we just give this day to you in Jesus name as we worship you uh, in our hearts and in our understanding in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So before we get to the sermon, I want to remind you that if you've missed any of the previous messages, you can find them online at shorelinefullgospel.org. Also at our YouTube page, Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship, or on my personal YouTube page, Tom Lau. So uh, before we begin, let's open with a little bit of praise and worship with my brother, uh, Reverend Aaron Baker. Amen. Well, good morning. These people have I made for myself said the Most High, that they might show forth praise. Are you ready? I welcome you this morning. I'm ready to praise. I hope you're ready to praise. But before we begin, let us give thanks and pray. Thank you, Father, for this time, for this honor. Thank you for this moment to open our mouths and open our hearts to give you glory, Lord. We present it to you humbly and gratefully. And we ask you to move mightily today through your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <sighs> You 
So welcome back. It's time to begin our Sunday morning message. The title of this message is The Ultimate Objective. So you and I live in a world that is full of people who are uncertain about their identity. They don't know who they are. They don't know why they are here. They don't know what their purpose is in life or if they even have a purpose. And when you don't know something, then there is an empty space within you that is waiting to be filled with the answer to that missing question. Who am I? What am I here for? Is there a purpose to my life? When you don't have the knowledge of those things, you could say that that person feels lost. The younger generation of today is mostly composed of billions of lost souls that have no idea who they are, why they are here, and even if their life matters at all. And so they don't have a purpose. And when you don't have a purpose, when your life has no purpose, you feel like there's no good reason to hold on to it. There is no value to it because it seems worthless. That's a problem, but it's not the truth. In every human's heart is a desire to be wanted, to be needed, to be valued, and to be loved. That is natural. That's inborn in every single person that comes to this earth by the way of the birth canal. God has us designed in his likeness and in his image, but he puts within our hearts certain desires that lead us back to him. What seems to be happening in the world today is a whole lot of trial and a whole lot of tribulation that is causing a whole lot of confusion. And it's bringing a lot of things to the surface that were always there before, but they were beneath the surface. When you bring uh, certain things to a boil, the stuff that's down lower, comes up to the top. Right now we're seeing a lot of these issues surfacing and people are seeing things in a new light. The age old question that every philosopher's heart has been asking through the centuries is this, what is the meaning of life? And without a meaning, life does not have value. 
A life without value is a life that is not worth living. But every life longs to find their meaning and their purpose. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, there is no future that is seen that you're reaching towards a purpose to keep going. When there's no purpose, there's no focal point, there is no future that you're reaching for, your life seems pointless. The word vision in its purest form here means a divine communication. And in military terms, it would be akin to talking about what are your marching orders? What is your divine directive? What is your marching orders? What is your commander telling you that you need to do? The directive of your commanding officer is the personal part you're going to play in this big picture that God has planned for all eternity. He has a place for you. He has a purpose for you. And you need to find out what that is. We are soldiers on this earth. There is a battle on this earth. There's nothing worse than an army of men who have no idea what they are fighting for, but they're just told to fight anyway. It kind of takes all your passion out of the fight. That was a major problem with the Vietnam War. My brother was in that war, and the objective of that war was often unclear to those who were fighting, and the troops weren't sure why they were even there many times. And this caused a real division. It caused a real lack of passion to move forward. It caused a lot of depression because people said, why are we here? What is the purpose? World War II was a completely different story, wasn't it? Everyone involved knew who the enemy was. They knew why they were fighting. They knew why they needed to fight, why they needed to stand up for the things that really mattered. They knew it was very clear. Well, the world is full of civilians who have not signed up and have not enlisted because they don't even know there's a war and they don't even know what the war is about. And they have no idea who the enemy is. You need to have a clear picture of what's going on in the spiritual realm before you'll enlist to do God's will. I want to say this to every Christian. Make no mistake about it. You are a soldier. Christians aren't supposed to be soldiers who wander around and start wars as they see fit. That's not what we're about. They're supposed to be soldiers fighting together on the same side for the same ultimate objective, which has been laid out to them by their chief commanding officer. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? You know, I'm not asking if you go to church. You can go to church and not be a Christian, just as like you can be born in a garage and not be a car. All right. Are you a person that says, well, when I was a child, somebody sprinkled some water on me. That does not make you a Christian. A Christian is a person who has acknowledged the sin in their life and their need for a savior who can forgive sins and has asked then Jesus Christ to come into their heart and forgive them and make his home in their heart and lead their life in such a way that pleases him. So it's a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. It's not something you sign up for uh, on a piece of paper. It's not something somebody just tells you you have. It's something you personally commit to. And this is a war that we're in, we Christians. And we've signed up because we signed up under Jesus Christ. He's our chief commanding officer. We are at war. We have an enemy who keeps fighting. He doesn't ever rest. He's continually fighting. And we have to continue to fight then to obtain the ultimate objective, our ultimate goal, which is set forth by our commander. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Just think about it. You don't need armor if there is no battle. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. This tells us who the enemy is. It's the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world, darkness, and against spiritual forces in heavenly places. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says this, join me in suffering like a good soldier. Once again, we're soldiers. A good soldier of Jesus Christ, a soldier refrains from entangling himself in civilian affairs in order to please the one who enlisted him. And what that's saying is this, is when you become a soldier of Christ, you got to give it your all. You can't divide your attentions between a million different things of this world and still be serving as a faithful soldier. You have to say, Father, I'm in your army. You're my commander, and I want to do what you tell me to do. 
and you begin to march in that direction. You begin to carry out his orders and his commands. It's not all about you. It's not about your vacation. It's not about your retirement. It's not about how you've cho chosen to live your life. It's about serving the one who is the king. Hebrews 2.10 says this, For it was fitting for him, for whom all things are and by whom all things are made, in bringing many sons to glory to make him, Jesus, the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He's the captain of this army. So once again, you're in the army now if you're a Christian. You're fighting a battle if you're a Christian. You have armor if you're a Christian. You have an enemy if you're a Christian. Romans 8, 37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You're only going to be conquering if there's something fighting against you that you need to conquer. And that is the situation. 1 Timothy 6 says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. You hear that fight, the good fight? There's a fight. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, when you said, I am a Christian, I claim Jesus Christ my Savior. It says, well, okay, then fight the good fight. 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. It's warfare. It's the way it is. There's a battle and we sense it. You sense it if you're understanding the things of the Spirit. There is danger. There is urgency. The day is short and time, the future, is getting shorter. The battle must go on. We must keep pressing on as soldiers until the very end of this battle. There's an ultimate objective about this battle. We are called to fight a common enemy with a common cause for a common goal. Everyone on earth has a need to have a purpose, and without a purpose, it's impossible for you to feel any self-value or worth. You need to know your purpose. Without a cause, something to fight for, it's impossible to feel that your uh, contribution is significant or that it even matters. So in these days uh, of strange and many faceted trials that people are going through right now, people who have found their worth don't find it in their jobs. They don't find it in the stuff they own. They don't find it in their hobbies. They find their worth in fighting the good fight of faith in the army of Jesus Christ for the good of all people, that all might know Jesus Christ, that all might be saved, that eternity might be a place that is full of souls who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So there's a purpose there. There's a purpose, and God's given us a purpose, and we're in his army, and so it's his purpose we follow, not our own purpose. People who find their worth in being part of a group or part of a team have been isolated in these days because of COVID from their group and from their team, and some of them have lost their feeling of self-worth because they're not with their team. They're not with their group. People who had common interests, like they had the same interest in sports or entertainment. They've been stifled from gathering together and, and getting in their groups to have these uh, things that they enjoy together. They've, they've been uh, um, unable to attend because the events have been suspended, so they're feeling rather alone. At this time of trials, people who have never really looked seriously at what their lives are all about are beginning to look introspectively at their life and realizing their life is mostly nothing about any lasting value, nothing about anything important, about nothing that has any eternal meaning or impact. So suicides are up, drug use is up, alcohol use is up, domestic violence is up, and a generation of people who have no direction are facing the fact that their lives really don't have a purpose. All of these things can be turned for good if we can get the attention of people to understand you do have a purpose, but it's only found in your Creator, in God. All of these things can be used for good. The Bible says this, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. We love the Lord. Let's, uh, let's help the Lord in this situation to wake people up to their need for Him. Not only do the lost lack purpose, but many of God's own children lack purpose too. They don't understand who they are. Many of the saved know the name of the commanding officer, it's Jesus Christ, but they don't know what his marching orders are, they don't know who the true enemy is, and they have no idea what the ultimate objective of this war is all about, so they cannot fight with all their might, with all their passion. Paul was different. Paul knew what his purpose was. He knew 
what his commanding officer's objectives were. He knew that he was supposed to be doing certain things while he was here because he got his orders from God. And we need to be like Paul and say, I know why I'm here. I have a purpose while I'm here. I have an objective while I'm here. I'm in an army and it's the army of the Lord and we're going to win, but I have to be one who fights alongside of Jesus Christ, my Savior. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27 says this, everyone who competes, Paul wrote this, everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Therefore, Paul says, I do not run aimlessly and I do not fight like somebody beating the air. No, I discipline my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Paul is saying, I'm not playing games here and I'm not just punching at shadows. I am punching at the enemy and I'm hitting home and I'm doing things that actually matter, that actually count, that are effective for eternity. But I'll tell you the truth. Where there is a vacuum, where there is a void, if you don't intentionally put something in that void, something else will eventually fill it. Nothing remains a vacuum. So if you are one of the lost youth of today who has been out uh, of your normal activities because of COVID and you realize you have no direction as you begin to think introspectively like what's my life all about and therefore you feel you have no purpose then guess what somebody comes along who seems to have passion for something and you say maybe I should follow them and that's part of the problem right now we got all kinds of people because they've gotten bored sitting at home they've got to find something to have passion about and so some group comes along and they can be way you know, off in left field or wherever that is. And they can say, we want to fight for this. And they, they just join in with that because good, you have a reason, you have a cause, you have a purpose. I'm joining your purpose. But we need to get people's minds and eyes on the right thing. There is a purpose that matters. It's not all this temporal stuff. It's not being the part of a protest that, that, that saves you, that gives you eternal life. There is a purpose you have that God has put you here for a reason. Now, it's understandable that the lost look for where they fit in. They look for a place. They look for a group to join. Most of the people protesting and carrying signs and destroying property have no real clear understanding of why they're doing it. They're just following the crowd, okay? They're actually following something that uh, needs to be answered in their heart, which is a deeper issue where they're saying, I'm following because I want to feel I'm important. I want to feel I have significance. I want to feel that I have a purpose. But God has a purpose for us. When we look outside of God, we find the wrong purpose. But when you have no purpose, you feel worthless. So they've got to find some purpose. And if we don't direct them to Jesus Christ, they're going to find something else. There's an issue that needs to be addressed concerning those who are enlisted in the Lord's army, those who know Jesus Christ. Our battle is not the same as the world's battle. Our commander-in-chief is not the same as the world's commanders in chief. Our ultimate objective is not the same as the world's, but unfortunately, most Christians are just like the world and don't know what their real purpose actually is. So they take their cues from the world. It's not the way it should be. Understand this, we do have an enemy. He's real and he has troops and they're not flesh and blood. Ephesians 6:12. for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against the spirits in heavenly places. Our enemy and his troops are not humans. They are spirits. Now, sometimes these spirits will get a hold of humans and function through them, but in the end analysis of everything, spirits are behind it. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be sober-minded and alert your adversary, the devil. That's your adversary, the devil, not people. Prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Your adversary understands his enemy. That's you. Okay? He knows what his ultimate objective is. And he skillfully uses schemes, deception, and his plans and his plots to defeat you because you belong to God. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11 says this, If you forgive anyone, I forgive him also. And if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ for your sake. In order, why are you doing all this forgiving? In order that Satan should not outwit us, for we are not aware, unaware of his schemes. See, one of his schemes is to get us all wound up in bitterness and unforgiveness towards people. 
And, and the Lord says, don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. Don't have unforgiveness. There's a spirit behind that, and it's trying to catch you off guard. Do you see what's going on when we wage war effectively? You've got to be battling the correct enemy. The enemy isn't in flesh and blood. The enemy is a spirit. The world doesn't know him like we do, and he doesn't. the world doesn't understand him like we do. We understand his tactics and his objectives because we know the Word of God and we have the Spirit of God. He knows who he is, but he doesn't want you to know who he is. He knows what his objectives are, but he doesn't want you to know who they are. The devil tries to stealthily do many of the things he does so that Christians won't stand against them. We have to be able to see things with the right eyes, the eyes of the Spirit, looking through the Word of God. The enemy's desire is to defeat you. He knows who you are because upon being enlisted in the Lord's army, your name was written in a book. In a book in the Lamb's book of life. And the Lord has set a seal upon your forehead. You belong to him. And the enemy knows you. He knows who you are. You need to know who he is. His desire is to take you out. His tactics are varied and his weapons are always based in deception. John 10.10 10 sums up what the enemy is all about. The thief, which is the devil, comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus says, however, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So Jesus knew who he was when he came to earth. He knew who the enemy was when he came to earth. He knew what his ultimate objectives were when he came to earth. And as we study the word of God, the word of God tells us what those things are so that we can uh, stop believing what the world is saying and what certain people are preaching and say, we take our commands directly from God's word because the Bible is God speaking is the thing that tells us the truth of God. And even when we hear from a spirit, we compare it to the Bible because the Bible keeps us in line with the truth. And what God speaks to you will never contradict what God has said in his word. Jesus came on a mission. Jesus had a purpose and he had an ultimate objective. The ultimate objective was what his father had sent him to do. So Jesus came. He did his thing. End of story. No, there's more. There's more to the story. We have understood Christ's objective, but we have lost our objective. So why did Jesus come? Ask yourself that question. Well, there's several reasons. I'll point to the same thing. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he came for, to seek and to save the lost. But what else did he come to do? Well, John 3, 8, but when the people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to save the lost. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And uh, what else? John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus is saying, and these things that I've come to do, to save the lost, to destroy the works of the devil, I'm doing them because they are my Father's will. And that is my main objective is to carry out his will. So what was the Father's will? What was the Father's ultimate objective? 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but, here's what he wants, everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to turn to him. And what was the motivation of the Father? What was his motivation? We know what, his, plan, what his, his desired end was, but what's the motivation? What was motivating him to do this? John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's because God loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life because God didn't want us to perish. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son to judge us, but to save the world through him. There's his ultimate objective, to save the world. It's so easy for us Christians to codify, to understand what Christ's mission was. But then there's the disconnect. What about our mission? We understand Christ's purpose. We understand Christ's mission. We understand Christ's uh, uh, ultimate objective. But most of us don't understand ours. Let me say it again. Most of the church has no idea what their purpose is. They don't know what their role is, their objective in the battle. They have no idea what that is. They don't know what they're fighting for, most people. We fight against flesh and blood often. We fight for the wrong causes often. We fight where we have uh, never been commanded to go sometimes. We pick our own battles. We battle with methods of the world that are powerless in the spiritual warfare. 
we sometimes forget who we are or that we're even soldiers that belong to Christ or that we are even supposed to be fighting for him and not for ourselves. We're uncertain about our purpose. We're uncertain about our direction. But the apostles, they knew where they were going because they had been trained properly. And the apostle Paul, don't forget, he said, I do not run aimlessly and I'm not one who just beats the air. He knew exactly what he was doing. So in our confusion, we look for somebody else carrying a banner and making a loud, passionate noise. And we join in with their crusade because they seem to know where they're going and we're not sure where we're going. We need to be sure where we're going. We need to know what the ultimate objective of God is. We need to know how we fit in his army, what our part is to play. But the problem, once again, is we've been disconnected from the head from the headquarters, from the chief. We've been disconnected from him. And when that happens, communication is cut off. And when that happens, the members of the body don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And sometimes the people that look like they know what to do and know where they are going are indeed led by the Spirit, but not God's Spirit. We need to know God's Spirit for ourselves, be connected to him for ourselves, understand his will for ourselves. And many times we've been deceived by people following some other spirit, but they had a lot of passion. I know of some people who are so spiritual that they get all their directions from their own personal angelic visitations. And they regularly have these, but this poses a problem. Getting all your information from angelic uh, visitations. There's a big problem with that. Do I believe in angels? Of course I do. Do I believe that should be the majority of where you get your information? Definitely not. Why do I need a middleman, an angel, to speak for the Father that I'm connected to? Why do I need the angel to tell me what the Father's saying? That's like a husband and wife at either end of a table, and uh, they're saying to the person in the middle, will you tell my wife so-and-so? And then the husband says, will you, or the wife says, you tell my husband so-and-so? It's like, we don't need to talk to that person. We'll talk directly. You know what? You're a child of the Father. The Father's Spirit is in you. And the Spirit of God that's in you communicates with you. Why are you talking to angels? Because I'm telling you, that's a dangerous thing. Not all angels are God's angels. Some are demons disguised as angels. That creates a whole lot of false doctrine. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says this, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Hey, he masquerades as an angel of light. And you go, well, he was supernatural and he looked like light. That doesn't mean it's from God. You need to get your understanding of God's word from the Holy Spirit who lives within you, not from angels who live outside of you. So if you're cut off from the head, the communication from the headquarters, who are you listening to? Well, I guarantee whoever you're listening to, it's not the right one. Even if it's yourself, it's not the right one. You need to be connected to the head. Not the news channel, not an angelic being, not somebody who thinks they've got it all figured out, but you have no idea where they got their information. You need to get it from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God for yourself. The devil's purpose in causing you to receive other information is to deceive you, to get you off track, to get you ineffective and unfocused. There's a great disconnect in the body right now. There's a con disconnection from the head, which is from Christ. Because of the interference and the distraction and the techniques that the enemy uses to get our eyes on other things, misinformation and confusion are brought in. And suddenly we don't even know who we're fighting. We don't know why we're fighting. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing because we're listening to everything but the head, which is Christ. Distractions disconnect us. They scatter us. They confuse us. This little fire here, you got to put out. This little fire here, you got to put out. And this thing's happening over here. And this riot over here. And this protest over here. You're so confused. There's so many things that are your enemies that you forget who the real enemy is. There's a great disconnect in the body of Christ right now. It's as plain as day. It's right before our eyes. But your eyes have to be looking at it and not distracted from all the other things. You need to be looking at what the Word of God says and the Holy Spirit says. Because you need to be connected to the head. It's time for the troops to reestablish re a connection with the head. To reconfirm their marching orders with the head. For us to refocus our purpose and focus on the things that God has told us to focus on, not what the rest of the world is telling us to focus on or even what other Christians are telling us to focus on, but to focus on God's main objective for his army because we're fighting for him. It's not for ourselves. Too many of our troops are out there drinking other stuff and they're drunk 
and they don't even know what's going on. The intoxications of the world have caused them to lose focus. Other of our troops are AWOL. They're not at their posts. They're not where they should be. They're not manning their posts. They're not paying attention. They're absent without leave. Some of our troops are shell-shocked from all the atrocities they see all around them. It creates such panic and shock and confusion in them. They're, they're believing that uh, uh, they can't do anything about it. They don't have enough power to overcome this horrible stuff that's going on because they've lost their focus on their commander, Jesus Christ. They've forgotten what the mission is, the mission of the church, the mission that God gave to each person that's connected to the head. The connection, the purpose, the plan, the direction, the ultimate goal needs to be reestablished. It needs to be confirmed in the mind of every soldier of Christ so that we can begin to fight the good fight of faith effectively. John 20, 20 through 21 says this. After he said this, he showed them his hands. This is Jesus showing him his hands. And the spear mark in his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw it was the Lord. Again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the father has sent me. So also am I sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, hey, guys, I want to get your attention. I've, I've, yes, I have risen from the dead. This is really me. And I want you to understand a couple things. First of all, for the same mission I was sent on, I'm sending you to do the same mission. And by the way, you're gonna need some help. So he breathed on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit because he's gonna be the one that helps you. Okay, so some people say, well, Jesus said that to the apostles, the 11, because obviously Judas was gone. He said it to the 11. So that applies to the apostle. He wasn't talking to the rest of us. Well, you don't understand the word of God. The answers are found in the word of God. Yes, he was talking to the rest of us. To say he was just speaking to the apostles only, those apostles that are all dead now, would be unreasonable. So the apostles, uh, they're going to carry it on until they die. And once they're dead, nobody else is going to carry it on. That's absurd. The word of God makes it plain. We're to carry it on. Okay. The enemy hopes you'll believe the lie because then it'll be easier for you to say, that's not my job. Wouldn't it be easier for us to say, well, Jesus expected the, the first 12 to carry on with his same mission. And, and they were specially trained by him, but we're just common run-of-the-mill Christians and and that's not for us that's less left perhaps maybe just for some leaders but not for us oh you have the same mission as every other Christian soldier has it's a cop-out to say that was for them and not for us it's an excuse and it's a lie but if you choose to believe it then guess what you will lose clarity on what your personal mission is and what you should be doing and what your ultimate objective is which is the father's desire for this world you will lose focus on what the battle is all about. You won't recognize what the ultimate objective is. You won't understand your part to play in achieving it. You'll be like a lost soldier, not understanding where you're at or who you're fighting. But if what Jesus told those 11, remember Judas, Judas was not there. If that was meant for all, then I guess it would clear up a lot of questions about what we should be doing right now to achieve the ultimate objective that God has sent us to achieve that Jesus uh, uh, gave them orders to follow. If we began to believe that Jesus was speaking this thing, not just to those 11, but to all of us, then I guess that would clear up a lot of questions about what we should be doing, what we're supposed to be achieving, what our ultimate objective is, and what we have been commanded to do while we're here. Well, we need to look at the word. That's where the truth lays. I told you the word would tell us it's not just the 11. So here's where we're going to find that in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Meanwhile, this is, of course, after Jesus' resurrection. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples, there's 11 because Judas is gone, went to Galilee to the mountain Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He's saying, here's what I want you to do. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus said to them, to the 11, as I was sent, so send I you. Remember that scripture? And that was a command to the 11. But then Jesus also said this to the 11. He said, teach those who are believers, who you've made disciples, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So 
all the commands the apostles got, they are supposed to teach to all the people that get converted and become disciples. They said, Jesus said, the things I taught you, all the things you're supposed to be doing, teach that to all of them. They are supposed to be doing them as well. Let me read that again. Verse 20 in Matthew 28, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, talking to the 11. So did you really hear that? Did you hear that? He told the 11 to teach all believers to do everything he commanded the 11 to do, not just then, but forever, as long as there are new believers. And then he said, after you teach them this, understand this is that I will be with you all until the end of the age. What age? Well, that's the dispensation of grace that we're in right now. This is the time before Jesus returns and the white throne a judgment appears. Jesus had a mission, and in a nutshell, he was sent to the Father to seek and to save that which was lost and to destroy the works of the devil. What's your mission? Jesus says, as I was sent, so send I you. He came to proclaim the good news of salvation through his death on the cross. Jesus said this about his mission in reference to an Old Testament prophecy about his coming. Luke 4, 18 through 19, he's speaking of himself in this prophecy. He says this, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus is speaking about himself, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus says, I've got the good news. I've got the keys to, to everything that binds people, that I can set them free. And I've come to do my Father's will. And Jesus says, by the way, you're supposed to do that too. He came to do the Father's will so that no one would perish. And then he said to the apostles, I send you now to do the same thing I was sent to do. But that's not where it ended. Jesus knew that those apostles would die and that others would have to take up the cause after them and carry on the good fight of this battle that we are in to achieve the ultimate objective, which is God's objective. So Jesus told his apostles, go and make more disciples because you're not going to live forever. Make disciples and teach the disciples to carry out every commandment I have given you to carry out. So as good soldiers, not just soldiers, but good soldiers, we need to carry on in the mission to accomplish the ultimate objective. The main purpose of every Christian's life is to participate in everything at every level that facilitates God's plan in reaching every lost soul on earth. All other causes, political, social, personal, business, must be put beneath this cause, the ultimate objective, the salvation of all souls. All of our focusing of attention and resources on anything else must be subject to the greatest objective of all, which is God's great plan for this earth. God sent his son in the world to reconcile the world unto the Father, and he handed us the baton and said, now this is your command, carry it out, reconcile the world to the Father, prioritize it above all other pursuits. When a person can fully embrace this cause, their life, guess what? Now it has meaning, it has purpose, it has rewards that are beyond this life, they are actually eternal rewards. Are you willing to pick up your pack, your weapon, and do your part and start marching, doing the will of God, fighting the good fight of faith, being a good soldier, and running your course with all your heart, with all your passion, so that you can finish well, so that you can achieve the ultimate objective that God has in this plan for planet Earth. Your commander is calling you. He's trying desperately to reestablish connection with every troop, that's you, that's me. He wants you to be a part of this great victory that belongs to those who fight by his side for his ultimate objective, which is what? He wants every man on earth to know the truth about Jesus Christ, that salvation is found in him alone, and that there is a God in heaven who wants them reconciled to him so that he might be with us forever. We might be with him forever. God's greatest desire is to save us. God's greatest desire is to spend eternity with us. God's ultimate goal in sending Christ and in sending you and I is to save the world so that people might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, so that we all might walk in glory with the Father. He loves us. That's his motivation. But his plan is to send us out there into this world to be the soldiers fighting the good fight of faith 
for the greatest cause of all because we have a purpose and God's called us to it. So let's fulfill that purpose. Let's fulfill it with all of our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our strength and realize what really matters, what really matters are the things that matter for eternity, not the temporal things. God bless you. I hope this has stirred something up in you. I hope it's refocused you. So we'll see you next time. I'll let my wife close in prayer. Amen. Good morning, church family. Henry and I just want to send you our Sunday morning greetings, and I'm going to read to you a scripture from the Wiest translation of the Bible. It's a, a, a chapter of scripture, or excuse me, a portion of scripture that's very familiar to you all in Romans chapter 8. It says, therefore now there is not even one bit of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit that of the life in Christ Jesus freed you once for all from the law of the sinful nature and of death. For that which is an impossibility for the law because it was weak through the sinful nature, God having sent his son in likeness of flesh of sin and concerning sin, condemned sin in the sinful nature in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be brought to completion in us who not as dominated by the sinful nature are ordering our behavior, but as dominated by the spirit. Now, what I loved about that translation was it's saying not only is there no condemnation, but we don't have to bow down to the sinful nature anymore. Now, that's not to say that we don't give in to our carnal nature and there's times when we've all had a bad moment or two. But what the scripture has told us is that Jesus, through his offering, through the flesh, when he came as the man, Christ Jesus, the one intermediary between God and man, that one mediator, that he abolished that slavery that we had to sin. In other words, we have a choice now. We don't have to live after the sinful nature, but we are not only not condemned, he says we're no longer guilty and we're free to serve him in the law of the spirit. So let's go ahead and close in prayer with that in mind. Father, we thank you that whom the Son sets free, he is free and she is free indeed. Lord, I thank you that we are no longer bound to the law of sin and death to be obedient to our carnal nature, but you have set us free so that we are set free to do good works that we should walk in them, Lord. And Father, I just pray that every single man and woman that's joined us today that may be struggling or having some issue in their life associated with the pandemic or unemployment or uh, health issues or other financial, family, marital needs. I pray you just meet those needs right now, Lord. And Father, that you remind each one of us who we are in Christ Jesus, that no matter what's going on, we don't have to be a slave to our sinful nature anymore because we've been made free as sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great rest of your weekend. Henry and I wish you well.